How are you going to start this revolution? By killing. There always is, always forever. Is one, is one, is one. Decide yourself for your father. Always one, always one, always one. Time is long, time from behind you. Illusion has been just a dream. The valley of death that I'll find you. Now is when on a sunshine beam. Nice day, a little cooler today. Sunny skies, high near 85. Moderate smog, that means quite a bit. Right now it's 62 degrees in Hollywood. Sharon Tate and husband Roman Polanski moved to Los Angeles. She calls, I come if I can. You know she's good to me. While Roman was in London prepping his movie, The Day of the Dolphins, Sharon shared the house with Roman Polanski's Polish pal, Wojtok Frakowski and Wojtok's girlfriend, Abigail Folger, the San Francisco socialite, who was known as being the heiress to the coffee fortune. And then Jay Sebring, who was actually the former fiance of Sharon, showed up pretty well every day to hang out with the foursome. in the spring of 1968, Spawn Ranch was idyllic. We were very accepting and loving. The music really pulled me in. We weren't catty, we weren't jealous. We just all just kind of loved each other. Home was the ranch. Home was Charlie and all the people at the ranch. I met Charlie at Spawn's Ranch. I was walking up Santa Susana Pass Road. I was picked up by uh, Dee Dee and Stephanie, and they took me to where the family was staying, and I got um, immersed in the milieu there. It was like being pioneers. You know, it's just, wow, this is cool, this is fun. The first thing that they uh, asked me if I heard of the White Album, the Beatles White Album, did I know about Helter Skelter and all this stuff. In the winter of 1968 and the spring of 1969, Charlie Manson, he's playing him the Beatles' White Album over and over, and here are the messages the Beatles are sending us. This is not a 
Charlie really believed that the Beatles were sending him a subliminal message in the White Album. He played it forwards, backwards, slow, fast. Manson became so obsessed with that 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 was all he cared about. When we would listen to it on acid, would say so much more. And there were just little things in and out, like we were calling for their monkey. And a long time ago, we used to call Charlie the monkey. You know, just all kinds of things that made it seem real to us to connect the Beatles with us. We just thought that they were singing about us. It was like to him and then of course to us that the Beatles had tuned in to the consciousness and Charlie was tuned into the consciousness. Dennis Wilson would say Charlie's cosmic, you know. He gets messages from Beatle records like the White Album, but everybody did that. I mean, every rock song was a prophecy to my generation. This is where Charlie gets the idea that Helter Skelter, the apocalypse is coming. Blackbird works it very well. Piggies works it very well. We're only waiting for this moment to arise. And then, have you seen the little piggy? And at the end of the song, it had like a, like a kind of a machine gun. Then there's the song Helter Skelter coming down fast. Helter Skelter was the new name for this race war that he'd been talking about. When Helter Skelter comes down, the cities are going to be mass hysteria and that the cops won't know what to do. The blacks would rise, kill off the whites. Karma would be turning because of all that we've done to the other races. And then they would be unable to rule and run things, and so they would go to the only white people left to survive, which would be the family who had hidden, and ultimately, of course, Charlie. It was real. It was really real. Helter Skelter is coming down. You know, whether he was supposed to start it or not, but that it was imminent. Charlie Manson gets to the whole Helter Skelter idea, mostly after it's pretty obvious to him that he's not going to become the music star that he's promised his followers he's going to become. It gives him a new thing to predict is coming. And let's face it, there were race riots in every major American city. And Los Angeles was a tinderbox at that time. And he could say to his followers, see, I'm telling you, there are these great events, and we're right at the middle of them. We knew that we were part of the revelations in the Bible. We knew that we had part in it. God's getting ready to pull down the curtain on this game and start it over again with his chosen people. Charlie, at this point, was talking Beatles and Bible a lot. That if the Beatles said it or it was in the Bible, it had to be true. And one of the things in the book of Revelation is discussion of a bottomless pit. He says the Negroes are going to revolt and kill all the white men except the ones that are hiding in the desert. And he said that it was getting worse and worse and that he wanted to hide in the desert. Charlie preached when this terrible race war was going on all around them that they would go into the bottomless pit where underneath there would be a wonderful city they could live in. And there they would exist and there they would multiply. He wanted beautiful people to help repopulate and help the black man rule. I think he went off the deep end because I think he really believed it. That move from believing in the rational orderly world as we know it to this other mystical realm 
is really a move into insanity. Life is the struggle, the experience of existence to me. Some people don't like the struggle. I do. I like to struggle. That's the reason I like the desert so much. At the end of September, or partway through October of 68, Kathy came along and uh, she knew of a place in the desert, in Death Valley, that her grandmother owned. We met Kathy Gillis at a recording session. She had a boyfriend that, that was a recording engineer, and she was fascinated by our music. She was listening to the words. And she came up to Charlie and told him how much she liked the music. And he asked if she wanted to go for a ride. And she went for a ride with him and came back about a half an hour later and told her boyfriend at the time that she had just met Jesus Christ and she was going to go home with him. On that ride, she told him about her grandparents' place, the Myers. She told him how remote it was, and, and he said, that might be our place. She led everyone up, and the transportation used was an old green school bus that they painted and fixed up on the inside to look like a harem sort of effect. Now we took the bus to the bottom of Golder Wash and hiked up seven or seven and a half miles to Myers Ranch. And on the way, Charlie and the rest of them spotted, all of us spotted this Barker's Ranch. And a couple of days after we were there, we moved into Barker's Ranch and cleaned it up. Charlie found what he thought was a discarded landscape. And since he was a discarded person, that's how he kind of characterized it. He said, that's a perfect place for me, out in the desert. Nobody wants that place. Nobody wanted me. So I'll go out there and be unwanted and, and not be a part of all the trappings of civilization. One of the fallacies about the time they spend out in the desert is that they're stuck there a lot of the manson family members actually liked it out there they liked being out in the wilderness and the idea that we're really pioneers and it's just us and we've thrown off civilization i loved the desert we made a movie out there if you watch the movie, you can see it's all this sweet, everybody running around, jumping, having a good time. I was just showing people that we were free and that it was wonderful. Barker's Ranch, part of the rules was that while it was warm enough, that everyone was to go nude. So that I suppose that would stimulate sexual interest and everybody would wind up making love all day long. And I heard him comment once that wouldn't it be nice if all we had, if we could just stay in bed forever and make love? Charlie also got the information that there was a bottomless pit somewhere out in the desert. And there are, somewhere out in the desert, there is some kind of a lake under the earth. Once you went through the water, inside the earth, there was a place where people could live. I heard a lot of talk about the bottomless pit, and that didn't come out of Charlie's head. He got lost one time, and he calls it his 40 hours in the desert, rather than Jesus's 40 days. And he met up with a miner who told him the legends of Death Valley and how people had disappeared. And some people thought it was UFOs, and other people thought it that had found the passage to the inner world where El Dorado was. This miner told him, you can't be afraid of snakes because the legend says the passageways are covered in snakes. It's all fantasy, and that's how I took it. It was entertainment, fireside chats, 
you know, that was most of the entertainment within the group, playing music and uh, making up stories. We were looking for the hole. That's what we were doing in the desert with the dune buggy. And that's why we needed more dune buggies. We had a good idea that it was in the Death Valley area, but we weren't sure just where. He says it's underneath Death Valley that leads down to a city of gold that the Indians know about, and that every tuned-in tribe of people that's ever lived, the most tuned-in, have escaped the destruction of their race by going underground. Manson took people who mostly had bad self-images and convinced them that they were so great they were going to rule the world with him. They were in it for what they were going to get. Around this time, Charles Manson goes back to Los Angeles to give his music one last chance. I remember both Terry Melcher and Greg Jacobson came to the ranch and listened to us and Charlie play the guitar and sing. For the first time, Charlie made things really important, like this is an important person. For those of you that you know who you are that can't sing, just mouth the words, and the ones that can sing, you know, listen to each other. This is important, he's a big producer. Our music could go somewhere. <laughs> I arrived and met a bunch of people. They all sat down and they played, I don't know, a dozen songs. It was a big campfire. The Manson played the guitar and all the girls sang parts and harmonies and background stuff. And it was, you know, it was quite a, an interesting thing. And they, talked about how they all shared this and that. It was one big family, and that these were people who were basically disenfranchised by their uh, biological families. And uh, I thought, well, all right. I mean, it's kind of, you know, maybe this is what's going on today. We ran through the songs, and I remember Terry looking intrigued but uncomfortable. He looked at his watch and said, well, I got to get going. And so Charlie said, let me walk you back up. He said that Terry Melcher said he was going to get in touch and never did. He said things like, uh, people in Hollywood, they just don't know what their word means. And he says, where I come from, which is prison, but he didn't say prison, where I come from, your word is your bond, and you could die if you don't keep your word. Charlie got pissed off. And at this point, he turns all his attention to the desert. But he needed money for that, money for supplies and so forth. That's when things started going a little, little crazier. All the energy was about getting money to fund this move, this long-term move to Death Valley. We tried to do a nightclub at, in the saloon, and I think the police came and, you know, shut that down. Also, they did some drug deals, and I think Tex brought that element into the family. Charlie, because he was such a misogynist, always needed to have a man who he could send out to be in charge. Paul Watkins. He was just a young little kid. He wanted to play music. He was stoned all the time, more so than anybody. And he hung out a lot with Brooks. Steve Grogan was taught by Charlie to act really stupid and out of it around anybody that he didn't know so that he could be totally under the radar. And he was playing a game. Then there was Bruce Davis, who was really into Scientology, and he wanted to be just like Charlie. 
Bruce was more uh, his own person. Tex was a disciple. Tex was more subordinate. Tex very much wanted to prove to Charlie that he could do something big. There were some problems with various drug deals, and one involved Lots of Papa, a dope dealer. How'd you get a moniker like that, the name of Lots of Papa? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like everyone uh, that I meet seems that uh, I seem to be a daddy to them, more or less, because uh -huh. I'm always uh, trying to get some sort of advice, I guess, you know? Uh, but I don't practice what I preach. <laughs> Charles. Tex Watson sold some drugs to Bernard Lots of Papa Crow. Somehow Crow gave him the money and off he went to the Spahn Ranch with the money without delivering the drugs. He gave the money to Manson and Manson was going to use the money for one of his other dune buggies or his vehicles or whatever. Was it a, a personal dispute of some kind or what? Yes, yeah, sort of, with Charlie Watson. I mean, Tex Watson? Yes, Tex Watson. Tex, he had a girlfriend that lived near Bernard Crow. He burned Bernard Crow, so Bernard Crow kidnapped his girlfriend and then called the ranch, and Charlie got on the phone. Mr. Crow was not a happy camper, and he said, if you don't give me my money back or my drugs that you promised, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to create havoc. Bernard Crow is making grandiose threats about killing everybody at the ranch if he doesn't get his money. Charlie, he wouldn't take that lightly. Manson didn't want Crow to come over to the ranch, and he went to meet him. Where? An apartment on Franklin Boulevard, next to the uh, Magic Castle. So Tex has a little problem. He has a little problem. He just gives me a gun. He can't deal with it. I have to go deal with his problem. Which is? Lots of papa. Who? Some guy down in the, in the drug world. I had to go down and take care of some business that was not my business because he's too much of a coward. He's laying up underneath the bed with it. Bernard Crow didn't seem to, to see Charlie as as much of a threat as he should have. He's only like a hair over five foot tall. Charlie had a gun, a 22 gun, and it was called the Bunt Line. And it was called the Bunt Line because it had an extended barrel, supposedly like Wyatt Earp's Bunt Line special did back on the frontier. Mr. Manson pulled out this gun, leveled it at it, Crow, and pulled the trigger. I've been told that uh, Charlie Manson shot you. Is that true? Uh, yes, he shot me, yes. Crow was shot in the gut and then went down like a, like a felled tree. Two days after he was watching the news and saw that a Black Panther's body had been found, he put two and two together in his head. That must be Bernard Crow. He must have been a Black Panther. Bernard Crow was the beginning of him just being cornered and getting totally frantic and paranoid. Everything changed after Bernard Crow. There was no more fun and games. Charlie pulled me aside. He said, uh, Bobby, I killed a Black Panther. And at the time I showed up, he was worried that he didn't have enough men. So he asked me if I would come and stay at the ranch and, uh, and just be there to, to give him some support. There was no question that he believed that he had killed this guy. Charlie truly believes that the Black Panthers are going to descend on Spawn Ranch to kill them all. He tries to arm the family. He had lookouts, Clem and Bruce Davis some of the time. He had a couple of guys looking down the road in case a carload of Black Panthers came up towards the ranch. I've seen uh, approximately a knife on everyone, and Charlie sometimes has two or three with him. And I've seen him that he can throw a knife approximately 10 or 15 feet and be deadly accurate with it. Charlie gave us all like a six inch buck knife. 
and said, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to show you how, you know, to kill somebody with the most effect. This would be our way of protecting ourselves when the world would come crashing in on us and you would take the knife and you'd stick somebody with it and be sure to wiggle it around a lot to get any organs that you could get to be sure that you would kill the person. You put the knife in and then I think it was draw upwards. We were like really building up this kind of army, you know, really. His personality changed. He was mean all the time. Everything had to be done exactly like boot camp, like I say so. He had been saying for a long time to us, this is going to come down and you got to be ready. Because when it happens, this is going to happen just like that. And to us, it was like it started. And the only way we're going to survive is to listen to him and do everything he says, because the Black Panthers are going to kill us all. That's when he asked the motorcycle club that we were just visiting to please stay for a while and protect the ranch. Danny DiCarlo and the Straight Satans were like a protection and a provider of weapons. You taught the girls to shoot, eh? How to break a weapon down, how to clean it, all that stuff. Yeah. Brought everything. I brought my whole arsenal up. You know, I had three rifles, I had a couple of handguns, I brought a machine gun up there. There was more like a criminal element that showed up. You know, there was more drug deals, and there were knives, and there were guns. I showed them how to use a gun. You made your own ammunition. We made, we were, yeah, every, we made everything, all our own ammunition. It was just there was this frenetic energy to put together a plan and supplies and gasoline and all that to, to head to the desert and wait for the helter skelter war to be over. I mean, it was crazy, crazy talk. He was always playing mind games. The creepy crawly missions was part of that. They'd dress up in black clothes, and then they would sneak into people's homes and eat some food, rearrange the furniture. I don't think they stole anything. It was just a mess with people's minds and instill fear. When he started taking the kids on what he called creepy crawls, where you snuck into someone's house and moved things around, he was actually getting him used to, you know, burglaries and calling it something cute. I think for the most part, it was this whole exercise in sneaking into people's houses and just messing with their psyche. like. I didn't leave that there, and who drank the milk? One time, Clem sat behind people watching television and was just silent. He told me they were all fat and watching TV and sitting there feeding their faces. You know, we were taking a lot of drugs, a lot of heavy drugs, like Belladonna. We were sitting around a campfire one night. I remember it very plain. It was dark. and. Um, all the girls were sitting around, and he put a knife to my heart, you know? He said, will you die for me? Yeah. In other words, will you give your life for me? I said, yes, without a doubt. Charlie frequently talked about ego and the need to destroy it, and he had somehow managed to get Tex to surrender his will, in a sense, to him. This is what life was like. It wasn't sunshine and roses. Manson brainwashing. Manson telling the girls what to eat, what to drink, who to sleep with, how to sleep with, who to have sex with, boys, each other, a whole panoply of sexual orgies. Group orgies was the way to get tuned in. He wants everybody to do everything, and you can make love with six or seven people at the same time, if you get tuned in, is what he says. Charlie used to play Jesus Christ, and, and he used to put everybody through the tests of death 
he told Brooks Poston to die. And Brooks Poston actually went and lay down for several days without eating until Charlie said, you can come up, you know, you can rise. Charlie played these games with them. And Charlie told them what to do, and they did it. He, you know, would often tell us that we didn't really need food, and he was always trying to get us to not feel pain, holding our fingers over a candle flame. And, yeah, it hurts, it's, you know, uh, just, you know, get beyond it. It's not, you know, it's not really... Pain is just in your mind. Charlie was so sweet and kind and cruel and nasty, and they obeyed. They obeyed. LSD, it's so powerful. You just really feel like at one with the Earth and the universe. I mean, you just kind of like everything starts making more sense. He did take acid in the beginning, but he realized that he could control us better if he didn't take any or as much. Wasn't as if Charlie was acting like a staff sergeant and yelling out orders, but when he told you to do something and he gave you instructions, everyone knew that you had to do it exactly the way he wanted you to do it. I've had my life threatened several times, and he's, I've seen him jerk people around by the hair, hold a knife to their throat, and say, you know I can kill you, don't you? And then after that he says, but I wouldn't because you're one of us. The first time he hit me, I remember he slapped me because he wasn't feeling good. I had asked him, you know, can I do anything? You know, can I do anything for you? And it was just like, he just s slapped me. And then the other girl said, oh, you know, he's not, you know, he's not feeling good. And, you know, you got to be careful about what you say. What do you think of women? Oh, I like them. Yeah, they're nice. If they're put together well and everything, and they're soft and spongy, yeah, they're nice. As long as they keep their mouth shut and do what they're supposed to do. I remember one time I was doing dishes, and he wanted me to come to the circle, and I just wanted to finish doing it, you know? And it was just like, no, you, you know, you're going to do what I say now. And he, like, kind of whipped me with a, an electrical, like an extension cord. I remember him kind of, like, winking at me, like, you can take it, Snake. I'm using you as an example. And then the next time I remember is that when the time when he wanted me to listen to the White Album and I needed to go to the bathroom. And so I ended up, you know, peeing on the rug because he wouldn't let me leave. I think he broke a chair leg, you know, like threw a chair at me and the leg broke off and then he hit me with the chair leg. And then when we were out in the desert, he, he threatened to hang me upside down and skin me alive. And I, I, I believed him, you know. He's beaten up several girls that I know of. Uh, one, Mary Brenner. I've seen him jerk her around by her hair and slap her and make her cry while he was making love to her at the same time. We only saw his good side for a very long time. By the time I got to the point where um, I realized that there was no crossing him, and I, I got the other end of his fist, it was just too late. I remember we were at Spawn Ranch in the front, and I hadn't had sex with him for a while and was feeling, you know, kind of left out. And so I, you know, got up the nerve to, you know, uh, come on to him. And so we walked back to that little gypsy caravan that's in this meadow. And he took me in there and, and then um, turned me, you know, turned me around and, you know, really roughly sodomized me with no, you know, no, nothing like he had ever done before. Not, you know, not sweet and tender and, you know, ma it wasn't magical anymore at all. It was just brutal, 
rape. When he was finished, he, he said something to the effect of, that's the way we do it in prison. I was so conflicted and so hurt, and I just, he laughed and I cried. And then I went down to the stream and just sat in the stream because I was bleeding. And just cried. It was after that that I really uh, was really lost. And um, at, at Spawn Ranch, I was considering jumping off the cliff behind, like, George's house. I really wanted to kill myself. T-minus 15 seconds from the Apollo 11 liftoff. 12, 11, 10, 9, Ignition sequence start. Six. landing was advertised and I remember watching the moon landing with the TV on George's stoop this is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 105 hours uh, now into the flight to Apollo 11 the world waits curious wondering aware a moment sensed, more than understood. We copy it down, Eagle. The Eagle has landed. I remember us all standing around in awe, and then looking up at the, you know, looking up at the moon. It was like, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Southern California is on a collision course with disaster. The crisis we face is in the air around us. For more than 20 years, Los Angeles residents have been subjected to the eye-smarting, lung-choking stench of smog. There is alarming evidence which indicates the levels of pollution in Los Angeles are continuing to rise. When we were getting ready at Spawn Ranch to try to go to the desert, Bobby came on the ranch to come help us all get protected. He hung out with the bikers, and he got enthralled with them. He thought, you know, iron horses, freedom. So he wanted to be a prospect. I really wanted to be a part of that. You know, I, I was a wannabe, and uh, I wanted to be accepted. I was building a bike. I liked the lifestyle. The whole motorcycle culture, the biker culture, represented a kind of freedom that I longed for. And I did learn that the straight Satans were getting ready to celebrate their 10th anniversary as a chartered club. They were saying that they wanted some kind of drugs besides downers and alcohol and maybe some acid this time. And he said, well, I don't know where we can get acid, but I know somebody that makes masculine. And that was Gary Hinman. 
Gary wasn't like a, a, a dealer, a real dealer by any means. He was just a, a guy who sometimes uh, helped to make ends meet by selling a little bit of pot to his friends. Bobby wanted to ingratiate himself to these guys, so he went to his, you know, friend and made a deal. Well, mescaline will get you sick. It cleans you out before it gets you high. So they thought they had been poisoned. They thought it was bad drugs. And they cornered Bobby. They beat him up, and they threatened his life and said, get us our money back. Bobby and Mary and Betty went to Gary Henry to get some money. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. I thought I could just explain what the problem was and he would give me the money back. So anyway, we talked about it and I told him what, what had happened and uh, he says, well, Bobby, I don't have the money. And then I'm starting to get frantic. Bobby asked one of the girls to, you know, keep the gun on him while he went around the house to see if there's any money. And there was an altercation and the gun was thrown out of her hand. I heard some yelling from the kitchen. And I just immediately just spun around and, and ran into the kitchen and saw Gary trying to turn the gun on me, and I just dove at him. We were struggling, and the gun went off. And um, in that instant, I was able to take the gun from him. Well, in the meantime, Mary ran out and called Charlie and said, it's all out of control. We both calmed down. I put the gun away, and Gary and I sat down at the table again, and we became aware that someone was coming to the front door, and Gary went to answer it, and he opened the door and said, hi, Charlie. And uh, Charlie stepped into the front door and just slashed him across the face without, without a word, without warning. I said, Charlie, why did you do that? And he said, showing you how to be a man. He and Bruce left. As quick as they came, they left, and uh, Travis said, tell him about clean this mess up. Gary was bleeding. He's holding his hand up to his cheek. I spent uh, the next day with Gary. I was terrified of taking him to the hospital, and that's exactly what I wish I had done. Bobby stitched him up and put antiseptic on it, gave him first aid, but Gary was adamant about going to the hospital. Bobby knew he, the first thing he would do is, you know, say what happened and he'd go to prison, and he made the worst choice that a human being can make. So I called Ranch and, uh, and got Charlie on the phone, and I said, man, I don't know what to do. Um, and he, he said something to the effect, you know what to do as well as I do and hung up on me. And maybe a half hour later, I stabbed Gary to death. I looked up and Mary was standing in the doorway uh, with her eyes just, you know, as big as saucers. Uh, she was horrified and I mean, it was just reflected back at me, the way I felt about myself at that moment. I don't remember anything else. I don't remember writing blood on the wall. I don't know that I did that. I had always assumed it was me. I remember a little bit of driving back to the ranch and um, I spent time down at the creek. Charlie found me down there. He said to me, how's it feel to kill your brother? I hated him in that moment. Only one of these men is the real Jay Sebring. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel on To Tell the Truth. 
J.C. Sebring was a hot property. Number three, how do you cut hair for a toupee? Well, you blend it in with the hair. <laughs> he was a booming star in his own right. He was the hairdresser to all the top major movie stars, and Henry Fonda and Paul Newman and Steve McQueen, and earned huge amounts of money. Will the real J. Sebring, please stand up. <laughs> he was also a friend of Sharon Tate. And in the summer of 1969, Sharon and Roman were living in the house where Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen used to live on Cielo Drive. And while Roman was in London, Jay Sebring was hanging around at the house with Sharon. Sharon was very pregnant, about to deliver. A lot of Hollywood stars knew she was pregnant and liked to stop by and talk to Sharon. There was always a party going on there. I am a mechanical man. A mechanical man, and I do the best I can because I have my family. I'll... I am a mechanical boy. I am my mother's toy. I met Charlie on a road trip. We were near Big Sur. Charlie thought he was going to be, you know, a, a music star, a rock star. And I remember going to the Esalen Institute. He took his guitar and he told me, stay in the van while I go in there, and I'll be back in a little bit. I think that he was thinking that they were going to be really blown away by his talent and, you know, ask him to come back and possibly pay him for, you know, his music abilities. But uh, they didn't. He was pretty upset when he came back. The fact that these people were not um, impressed with his talent made him angry. When he got back on August the 8th, he said, now is the time for Helder Skelter. And that meant now was the time for the race war. So how are you going to start the, uh, this revolution? By killing. By doing a murder that had no sense behind it. Because the more fearful the people get, the more frantic it will get, and the faster it will happen. He gathered some of his family members, Susan Atkins, Tex Watson, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Cranwinkle. He told them that now was the time for Helter Skelter. I was told to go get a change of clothing and um, a knife, my driver's license, and meet back. Manson told the girls to do whatever Tex says. I'm a Felton. Take a knife, take a gun, and take a change of clothes. He gave me the exact orders and then told me a bunch of stuff to write on the walls and stuff. And so I went and got in the car. Manson said to Susan Atkins, leave a sign, something witchy. I remember getting in the car with Tex. And before I ever got in the car, Tex and I had our own special little stash of uh, cocaine. I, mean, I think it was cocaine or methadrine, I'm not sure which. We did with speed, and we both snorted some speed. We were really wired up, I guess you would say. There wasn't any fear. There wasn't any fear in us. We were just wild, just in groove, you know, I guess you would say. We drove to the house with instructions to kill everyone in the house.
when we first went in, um, one of the people said, who are you? And Tex said, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. I was the first a reporter on duty on that Saturday. We suddenly got a call from the assignment desk. There's been a 211 in Beverly Hills, and they gave us an address, Cielo Drive. That didn't ring any bells. And we pulled up and parked where we could by the, by the side of the road walked up to the gate. We didn't know who lived there or what was going on. There was a body in a car that you could see through the gate. The gate was closed. LAPD had people inside. As the morning wore on, more and more camera crews began showing up. When I got there on that Saturday morning, by then there were about 25 journalists, and we were kept outside the gates, and we were talking to each other and asking what's going on. The epiphany for me was when Rona Barrett showed up. Rona did gossip news for Channel 7 and for ABC at the time. And I went over to her and I said, Miss Rona, what are you doing here? She said, don't you know who lives here? I said, I have no idea. This is Roman Polanski's house. By pure chance, I had a friend who lived on Cielo Drive, three doors away, and I went to see him and use his telephone to phone in a story. And he told me that Sharon lived there with Roman Polanski. The tentative identification of the persons are as follows. Sharon Polanski, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Frykowski, Abigail Folger, and another man who is unknown. You have any kind of uh, an idea who might have done it? You have any kind of APBs out? Any suspects at all? No. Why is this yeah, case more complicated yeah, than other cases that you can't comment on? Well, what's the difference in this case? Well, how many cases and how many times do you have five persons that are found murdered at the same time? I was watching TV and Johnny Schwartz's trailer. I was just sitting there watching it. I was just sitting there and Sadie came in and demanded I turn the channel to the news. The first thing on the news was the story that Sharon Tate had been murdered. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. We heard the news and they said, oh my God, there were famous people. I asked Katie and she told me. She said that they had murdered five people and they didn't know who the people were. To think that she was strong enough in her believing, you know, to be able to go kill I wanted you to. Why in the world would you want to go out and kill somebody? Because it had to be done. It had to be done just in order for the whole thing to be completed, for the whole world's karma to be completed. We had to do this. Well, we were all sitting in the kitchen. Charlie pulled me out to the side and he said, are you crazy? And I said, well, yeah. Are you crazy enough to believe the way I believe, to see the way I see, that we have been sent down to start this in motion? And I said, yes, because I, I do. I'm crazy enough to believe it. And he said, are you crazy enough to be able to go out and kill someone for this? I said, yeah. But I was. 
So he said, okay, go get two changes of clothes and get in the car. So I did. Manson gathered Susan Adkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Linda Kasabian, Tex Watson, and Steve Grogan. We drove all over LA, and Manson was um, very agitated, and Kasabian was very nervous and upset, and he was yelling at her a lot. Manson led them to a house next door to where Lino and Rosemary LaBianca lived. That house at one time was rented by Harold True, and a friend of the family. Some of the girls had actually spent the night at his house, but he no longer lived there. Because Sabian asked, are you going to that house, pointing at Harold True's? And Manson said, no, I'm going next door. So Manson went up to the house. We sat in the car. Manson came back and he pointed at Pat and I and told us to get out and go do what Tex said. He said to Tex to make sure that everybody did something. Rick, move your head. 